Hello. Um, good morning or good early afternoon. Um, I hope you can see me and hear me well. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this new session on destination two of cluster one um, of Forest Europe, cluster uh, this destination. I don't know if, um, can you see the slide? Show that for you, sir. Slides are coming in a minute. All right. Okay, no worries. I, I continue with my introduction. So, um, this destination, destination two, called Living and Working in a Health Promoting Environment, which is the slide now, um, is looking, it's aiming at filling the knowledge gaps in the understanding of the impact on our health and our well being of those environmental, occupational, and socioeconomic risks, um, factors that have the most significant or widespread impact. Um, we are going to focus in this session in the topic that has been put forward for 2022 from Horizon Europe, and we're going to move to the next slide. The topic uh, with the budget, overall budget of 20 million euros that is looking for method Processing health related costs of environmental stress. Um, this topic uh, is precisely looking at the economic dimension uh, because the health costs of exposure to, um, to environmental stressors are not easy to quantify in the part of the, of the available evidence showing that the health impacts so for example, pollution can carry a significant cost to the society. For this reason, this, um, in this call, in this topic, we are looking for robust methodologies and good quality data sets that would support evidence and increase knowledge on this important topic for the society. There is a video uh, that you can find in the InfoDay website that provides more information, more in detail information about the topic, but in today's session, we will focus on answering the questions you might have on this particular topic. Um, before starting, jumping into the questions, uh, I would like just to maybe underline the, the importance of the different emphasis that Horizon Europe is putting on the expected outcomes and expected impacts. Expected impacts of this destination, you can find them in the introduction to the destination, and they are somehow defining the wider effects on society that we are targeting by putting funds into research and innovation. It's important that we consider them when you are preparing a thing. And then in the concrete topic, uh, you will find a description of the expected outcomes that will be the ones that will generate um, at the level. So uh, it's very important that you consider from the beginning from when you are thinking about the result, who will be the risk, the results that generate it. That will be the way where you will generate um, um, outcome. So um, I will not defer anymore the, the starting with the questions, and um, the floor is now with you. Please feel free to submit uh, the questions that you would have to say to give answers in order to propose um, to do some more exercise. I see there are several ones here already. Um, I see, and I forgot to mention that I am surrounded by, by the experts, the colleagues that have been working this proposal, and that I will give the floor to them for, for, for answering. So, um, the first question is um, whether the proposals should address all the metrics referred in the code, for example, the values and qualities. Um, I would like to pass the floor to a specific guy from the environment to provide an answer on this question. The fund is more expensive. Yes, thank you very much, Carmen. Um, just to address the first question, I. Uh, we can look at all the metrics. So we can look at uh, disability adjusted life years. We can look at quality adjusted life years. Uh, interestingly, in the environmental area, quite often we look at health endpoints themselves. So we might talk about a case of asthma or a case of cancer. And it's making the links as well between those individual health points and these metrics, which are used more in the medical side as well. 
So both are relevant. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Carry... Sorry? Would you like me to carry on with uh, the other questions? Or? Well, I think that the, the, the second question is, is for you as well, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so you can, if you are um, uh, able to provide an answer immediately, that would be great. Referring so, to the impact pathway analysis and mm. impact assessment methodologies. Yeah. So just to be clear, we're, we're interested in alternative methodologies as well. I mean, we're seeing this uh, health impact assessment in general being applied in different contexts. So chemicals, air quality, transport at the EU level, at the national level. So being able to look at these different methodologies um, and making sure they fit to the, the separate context, whether that be national, EU or different uh, health points. Uh, all are relevant, so we're interested in them in all. And I think they all have a lot of commonality in any case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, the next question is on international uh, cooperation and is asking how can international institutions participate? Should a dedicated budget for international cooperation be considered in the proposal? Um, I would like to give the floor to, to my colleague, Rosana Damario, uh, if she's... Uh, available to answer this question now. Rosanna, the floor is with you. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, so I, I hope to interpret the question uh, correctly. Uh, well, first of all, um, if a dedicated budget for international cooperation should be considered, we have to think about that uh, participants in consortia can be either eligible for EU contribution or not eligible. So this is the main question. Now, uh, with the term international institutions, I assume that the person who put the question wants to know uh, if we refer to organizations that are based in different countries, uh, which corresponds to the term of what we call international organizations. So if the term international institutions uh, corresponds to international organizations, the answer is the following. So there may be two cases and you may find all the information in the Horizon Europe Program Guide document. So international organizations can be either um, be made of many members based in uh, member states, in European member states. In this case, they are considered European international organizations. And as such, they are eligible for EU contribution. So it means that they can ask for contribution in the proposal. Uh, the second case uh, concerns international corporations that are made of many uh, countries outside of the European Union. In this case, they are not automatically eligible for questions and therefore they should not ask for EU contribution. But of course, even in this case, it is possible, for example, if this organization is really essential for the proposal, for the project to be carried on, they can still ask for EU contribution. And of course, they should justify it in the proposal. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna, for this very clear answer. Um, I see a next question on the national context that is referring different parts of the call. And the question is whether should the developed methodologies be applicable to the national setting? Um, Stefan, um, would you answer that question? I'd be delighted to. Uh, yes, it, they should be um, applicable to the national context. I think it's, uh, it's quite important if they're going to be applied that they are of use in a widespread number of situations. So uh, whether that's local, regional or national, I think all of those should should be of interest and should be a starting point for any work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question for you as well on the is saying is asking whether experimental activities should be considered because the topic invites for literature studies. So are experimental activities considered at all? And if yes, which kind of experiments? We would be interested in uh, experimental activities um, 
it's hard to specify which type, but for example, if one is looking to put a monetary value on a health endpoint, then choice experiment could be a technique to, to explore. Uh, it's already being used, but refinement of that methodology would be welcome. And also identifying ways for it to be more widespread, uh, have more widespread use. So yes, we would be interested in experiments. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, next question that has arrived is whether all the points listed in the scope should be addressed in the proposal. Rita, may I ask you to, to, to answer that question? Uh, yes, Carmen, thank you. Uh, so all the points that are listed under the expected outcomes and also under the scope are to be considered in the in the proposal. Under the scope, you can find uh, nine topics, and they all need to be uh, addressed uh, in the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Very clear. So, next question, I think, is also for you: is whether the networking activities between projects should be pro prom promoted at proposal stage? Yes. Um, so uh, we think that it's very important to promote networking activities between the projects because this will in increase the impact of the project, will allow for harmonization of uh, methodologies, uh, for increase of synergies between the projects. In environment and health, we have several ongoing clusters of projects. We have one project, uh, one cluster that uh, um, addresses the methods for assessing endocrine disruptors, the European um, uh, network on exposome, uh, and two recent uh, uh, also clusters, one on the uh, European urban, the European urban cluster, and the cluster uh, dedicated to nano to the health impacts of nano and microplastics. Um, the networking activities are not to be established at the proposal stage. They are going to be uh, done and uh, agreed uh, and uh, on the uh, stage of the grant agreement. But it's very important that the proposals consider already a budget dedicated to support these networking activities. That can include joint workshops, dissemination activities, or the organization of um, uh, working groups uh, of, on topics of common interest. Thank you, Rita. Um, I see there is another question um, on international cooperation about the uh, US partners. The question is, can the US participate as the granted partner? For example, does the European Union NIH reciprocal funding agreement apply? I think, Rosanna, you already answered to that question, but, but please have the floor. Um, because Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Well, yes, here the answer is very straightforward. Yes. Uh, there is the exception indicated on page eight of the work program. And yes, the uh, agreement, the reciprocal funding with uh, NIH still applies. So uh, the EU, uh, US entities can receive EU contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna, very clear. Um, next question is um, saying that this topic is not listed within the topics where the clinical studies template is essential. Is access to cohorts and the reuse of cohort data an asset? Um, Rita, can I pass you the floor to answer this question? Yes, thank you, Carmen. Um, the, the, the use of cohorts is not mandatory, but it should be considered if relevant uh, under the scope of the project. Okay, thank you, very clear. And I see um, there are no more questions that have been submitted and it's perfect timing because we are at 1.5, which is um, in theory, the end of the, of the of the session for this destination where in 2022, there was one, only one topic. 
so I would like to really thank you for your participation, for your interaction and the different questions that were put forward. And I will just um, end by wishing you a lot of success with the preparation and submission of your proposal. Thank you and see you maybe in other destinations discussions. <laughs>